In this session, we'll introduce uh, forces. We have three goals in this session. So we'll simply start talking about some concepts related to force. We will learn about three specific forces. The force of gravity, the force of tension, and something we call the normal force. And our third goal is to connect forces to the motion ideas, velocity, acceleration, etc., that we have discussed previously. What is force anyway? So how would you define force? Nice simple definition of force is that it's a push or a pull. A force is a vector, so it has both a direction and a magnitude. The important part here is that it has a direction. Forces are associated with interactions between objects. So whenever you interact with something else, then there's a force that you feel and that the object you're interacting with feels. So as an example, if you sit on a chair, there's an interaction between you and the chair. The chair exerts a force on you, you exert a force on the chair. Forces always come in pairs, and the pair of forces is associated with a particular interaction between two objects. Our unit is the Newton, and one Newton is one kilogram times a meter per second squared. So one kilogram meter per second squared is a Newton. So let's start talking about the force of gravity. Of course, this is the force that keeps us stuck to the Earth. It's also an example of a force that exists between objects without them having to be in contact. So, hey, we stand on the surface of the Earth, it sounds like we're in contact with the Earth. If we jump up, jump up off the surface of the Earth, well, we still have the force of gravity acting on us. It's the force that makes us come back down to the ground. So here's a particular example of the force of gravity interacting. Here's the sun on the left, here's the earth on the right. Both these objects exert forces on each other. They interact with one another. So there's a gravitational force that the sun feels, there's a gravitational force that the earth feels. Turns out that each object experiences a force of the same size. So these two forces, even though the objects themselves are very, very different, the Sun is much, much larger and much, much more massive than the Earth, but the two forces are exactly the same size and in opposite directions. So we say the forces are equal and opposite. Note that the force that one object exerts on the other always points back to the object exerting the force. So the force the Earth exerts on the Sun points back to the Earth. The force the Sun exerts on the Earth points back to the Sun, toward the object exerting the force. What happens on the surface of the Earth? Well, we drop a ball. The ball falls down like so, and it does so because of the force of gravity, the interaction between the Earth and the ball. So if we give our ball a mass m, then it turns out that we can say that the gravitational force exerted on that ball has a magnitude of mg, and it's directed toward the object exerting the force, that would be the Earth, so that would be directed down. In fact, it's toward the center of the Earth. g here is the value of the Earth's gravitational field at the Earth's surface. It has a value of 9.8 newtons per kilogram directed down. You may have heard this as 9.8 meters per second squared. Those are completely equivalent units. So uh, here we have a what we call a free body diagram. A free body diagram is simply a diagram of an object showing all the forces acting on it. So after you let the ball go, until just before impact with the ground, the only force acting on this object is the force of gravity. It's a constant force directed down. Its size is mg. Here's another force, the force of tension. So what is that? Well, it's a force applied by a string or a rope. 
We usually, I'm going to usually label this as F with a T subscript, but sometimes you see it labeled as simply T. Our assumption here is that uh, our ropes and strings don't have any mass and they don't stretch. So that's a bit of an idealization. Now always remember that you can't push with a rope. The tension force acting on an object that has a rope or string tied to it always goes away from the object along the string or the rope. Here's a ball. It's tied to a string. Maybe that string is being whirled around your head in a circle. So there's still a force of gravity. The ball interacts with the earth. And there's also a tension force that points, and this is the tension force that acts on the ball. So it points away from the ball along the rope or the string. Here's another force, something we call the normal force. Now, normal is a fancy word that we use to uh, mean perpendicular. Okay? So, what's perpendicular about this force? Well, the normal force is one of the two components of the contact force between objects. So, two objects come together, they're in contact with one another. One of the components of the contact force is what we call the normal force. It's perpendicular to the contact interface. The other co component along the interface is what we call the frictional force. We'll talk about that a little bit later, not today. I'm usually going to symbolize the normal force with an F with an N subscript, but sometimes you just see a plain old N. That could be a little confusing because N is our symbol for the unit of force, remember, so Fn is a little safer less confusing. So here's a particular example, very simple example, a box resting on the ground, on a table, on some horizontal surface. So what's our free body diagram look like? What does the free body diagram of the box look like? Well, the box is interacting with the earth, so it has a gravitational force acting on it. It also act, interacts with the table. So the earth is trying to pull the box through the table. The table won't let that happen and so it provides a force up on the box exactly equal in magnitude to the force that the Earth is pulling down on the box with. So here we have an upward normal force balancing the downward force of gravity. The box just sits there if we let it go from rest. Here's another example. We put some wheels on our box just to eliminate uh, most of the friction. It's a very low friction situation here. We still have a force of gravity. Again, it goes straight down toward the center of the Earth. In this case, the normal force, again, is perpendicular to these surfaces that are in contact, so it's perpendicular to the ramp. And that gives rise to a net force here. These forces cannot cancel out because they're not in opposite directions. So you'd have an acceleration down the ramp here. Okay, so let's talk about the normal force a little bit more. When does one object lose contact with another? So let's say you go to pick something up from the ground. Well, you can make it lose contact with the ground if you make the normal force go to zero. So here we have our box just sitting, minding its own business, on a flat surface. Here's our free body diagram again of that situation. So we want to lift this box up. We're going to do it by attaching a rope to the top of the box. And we're going to pull up on this. So we have a modified free body diagram. So first we just give a small upward force on the rope. So that force gets passed on by the rope to the box. So our upward force, this red tension force you see in the free body diagram, is acting up. The normal force then doesn't have to be as large. The combination of the normal force and the tension force are now balancing gravity. Okay, so that as the tension force increases in size, the normal force decreases in size. The box is still in contact with the surface. Finally, we get our tension force equal to mg. So now we're losing, just starting to lose contact between the box and the surface. Another way to look at the normal force is that it is the force that would be measured by a scale placed between the objects in contact. 
So if we go back to our simple box on the table situation, and then we just put a scale in between those objects, and so we rest the box on the scale, then the reading that we see on the scale is the value that of the normal force that would be exerted by the table on the box if the table was just if the box was just resting on the table again. Okay, so what are we going to do with all these forces? Well, we're going to somehow connect them back to the motion ideas we've done before. And we do that through Newton's second law. So Isaac Newton had three famous laws of motion, and the second law is the one which allows us to be very quantitative. So what it does is it states that the acceleration of an object is proportional to the net force acting on that object and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So we can write this out as an equation and there's no other constants, no factors of two, nothing like that. So we simply have Newton's second law. The acceleration is the net force, the vector sum of all the forces, divided by the mass. So that collection of symbols above the M here in the numerator, there is capital sigma there, that's the Greek letter sigma, and that says that it's a summation. Summation of what? Well, summation of F's. F's are forces. So it's a summation of all the F's, and there's a little vector symbol above the F, so it's the sum of all the forces added up as vectors. So that represents the net force, the vector sum of all the forces acting on the object. Take that quantity, divide by mass, you have your acceleration, which of course is also a vector. Newton's first law is also uh, kind of useful. It's really a qualitative statement of Newton's second law, actually. You've probably heard this before. An object at rest tends to remain at rest, and an object in motion tends to remain in motion with a constant velocity. What's a constant velocity? Oh, it's a constant speed and direction of motion. That's all true unless the object is acted on by a non-zero net force. So, if the net force acting on an object is zero, the object will remain at rest if it starts at rest. It will remain in motion with constant velocity if it already has a constant velocity to start with. If you have a non-zero net force, then it won't stay at rest if it starts to rest. It won't move at constant velocity if it starts at constant velocity. So implicit in that definition of Newton's first law is that at rest is actually a special case of constant velocity motion. You might look at something and see it at rest. Then you see it in motion with constant velocity. You say, hey, those are two very different motions. As far as forces go, as far as the free body diagram, the, the uh, diagram that shows all the forces acting on the object, as far as those things are concerned, there's absolutely no difference whatsoever be between an object that remains at rest and an object that continues traveling at constant velocity. At rest is simply a special case of constant velocity motion. It's when the constant velocity is equal to zero magnitude. Okay, so that is it for our introduction to forces. We'll certainly do some more over the next few days.